Hi guys, Jonathan here. Two revolvers on the table. The main one that we want to look at, or that you might have seen over on social media, is this one. It's a cartridge revolver. Five shot. It has a cartridge slash cartridge case ejector fitted under here. Not uncommon, of course, for cartridge revolvers. It has a loading gate at the back there. You can see quite a, quite a big old round there. And the front end, of course, the business, business end. Octagonal barrel, uh, quite a nicely finished rounded crown on there. Quite a long cylinder, you'll notice. Um, with the, the cutouts for the cylinder stop on the back, Again, pretty standard for revolvers of this era, and this era is, well, I'll explain that in a moment. Um, the trigger mechanism, as you can tell from the travel, is actually double action, or it's supposed to be. This one, the lock work on this is um, sadly not fully functional, so it won't stay in the cocked position. But um, yeah, it's supposed to be uh, double action, single action. So you cock it for an accurate shot or pull through for less accurate but faster shot or series of shots and these are so this is the an this is an <laughs> adams revolver but there are a whole series of adams revolvers this is pre the webley service revolver first comes in in 1887 and that follows up on the not very successful enfield mark one and mark two that we've covered previously in this series go back and watch those if you don't know what i'm talking about or you need a refresher um, and also head over to um, see an arsenal as well. And um, Matthias and may have covered um, some of this series of British service revolvers. But I'm jumping back in time to show you this one in particular, not just because it's lesser known compared to the Webleys, um, but because, well, th there's, a, there's an interesting quirk here to how the, the, the Mark I, um, this style of Adams, was actually produced. So the first, when I say series of Adams, the first Adams revolver uh, was 1851 that was uh, adopted for British military use. Uh, these are primarily naval, but also um, revolvers, revolvers do find service in the cavalry later on, but in, in British military service, they're, they're primarily for naval use um, or for officers, um, bought, purchased by officers and, and used um, in, in the normal way as sidearms, as self-defense weapons for leading a charge or something, if that's what you're doing. So the 1851 is it's probably my favorite revolver of all time. It's uh, um, self-cocking, so essentially double action only is what we'd call, call that today. So this broken <laughs> revolver here, that's the only way that works. You pull through on the trigger to fire it. The 1851 Adams, same basic profile, uh, obviously lacking this on the side because it's not a cartridge revolver. Um, 1851, distinctly percussion, and it doesn't have a hammer spur, so you can't cock it. Funnily enough, a bit like the um, the Enfield number two, uh, sorry, the, the Enfield number two Mark One Star Star, which has a which loses the hammer spur again. Funny how these things come in cycles. Anyway, in the middle of all, or right at the beginning of the story, but after the fifty one Adams comes well a different gun, <laughs> but also the same gun. What's he going on about? Well, these are actually conversions of these, which are the Beaumont Adams, 1854, originally. And there are all sorts of subtle variances in these, in these things, as I've realized, the more I look at them. Different proportions in the frame. Um, they're, they're interchangeable in terms of all loading the ammunition, the service ammunition, bullet and requisite amount of powder and the right size of caps and everything. But they're not really very standardized. They are, they are all handmade things. And so there's a lot of variety there which poses a bit of a problem later on when you're trying to convert them to take cartridges. Because to be clear, this uh, style of, uh, of Adams, you put a cap on each of the nipples on the back of the cylinder, and then you load your, your five chambers with uh, what typically a, a thin paper or a cartridge wrapped around the back of a bullet. So a little bit less time consuming than pouring in the right amount of powder and then pressing in the bullet, but not, not great. Um, so, Muzzle loading a cartridge, but without the primer, basically, and then caps on the back, and then it works like a modern revolver. So, so pretty good for 1854 onwards. Um, and then, so the War Office in, well, 
we hit, hit uh, about 1870 and people are starting to convert things to cartridge operation, obviously. So what do we do? Um, well, just like with the, the Snyder conversion of the 1853 Enfield rifle musket, the obvious thing to do is to, well, can you use the existing frame, lockwork, barrel? And the answer is yes, you can. So if I put these, if we put these side by side on the table, that's probably the best way to do that. And we can point out, I mean, hopefully you can see the similarities. They are literally the same thing with a few differences. So, so depending on the production series, you get some slightly different angles on things, but then there are, there are changes, there are standardized changes. So the cylinder, you can't really convert the cylinder. It's had too much metal chopped out of it. So you have to replace the cylinder. So that's a cost, that's a, a faff. <laughs> Um, so the cylinder is replaced with the percussion, uh, sorry, <laughs> with the cartridge cylinder. The loading gate obviously has to be added to the side of the frame. That's not too difficult to do. You also, you'll notice the groove here, deep groove to enable you to, well, here's one I prepared earlier. This is inert with hole drilled in it. You wouldn't be able to insert the cartridge. I would actually do that on this camera. You wouldn't be able to insert the cartridge did if you didn't mill out a big U-shaped channel in the frame. So that's a change. That will also let me demonstrate the other major change, which is to fit the ejector rod. So on this one, it does not move in its stowed position. You have to rotate it to this position to free it up to let it eject either empty round, uh, sorry, live rounds if you need to unload, or the empty case if you're in the middle of a firefight. Now. It's also designed as a safety so that, uh, let me see if I can get this right. So there's a position, I don't know if you can see, but there are two detents on this rod. There's one back here and there's one up here. Now that, I'll give you a better look at those. So if I position it there initially, uh, there's one, uh, what, what we call a detent, a little, little depression on the rod that something can lock into to hold it in position. That's the one for stowing the rod so that it's in this position and it can't move and it requires a bit of pressure to unstow it, if that makes sense. And then there's a second one back here. And what that lets you do is position it. If I can get this right. There we go. So same stowed position, but into the cylinder. What does that do? Well, you can't cock it which also means you can't fire it. It's a safety device. So they've turned the ejector rod into a safety. So when people tell you that revolvers don't have safeties, well, there are numerous examples of revolvers that do have safeties. This is one of them. So what are the changes? Let's go back to the, to the table. Well, you actually have to replace the hammer as well. So if we cock the percussion gun, you can see that it has to be very flat faced. To, to get a reliable strike onto the primer. Whereas the hammer on the conversion is very pointy because it has to strike the primer hard enough and, and, and in, uh, with, with a sufficiently small surface area to reliably detonate the primer. So rather than, um, I guess they could have machined off and, and fitted in a firing pin onto the face of the hammer. I'm surprised they didn't, to be honest with you. That's, that's a feature of, um, I suppose it's a bit they probably weren't convinced it would be strong enough at that time. But later on, independent firing pins that are replaceable become standard on hammers. So they didn't do that. So you replace the cylinder, you replace the hammer as well. The lock work inside remains the same. Uh, the grip remains the same. We've talked about how you have to modify the frame a bit already. You may also have noticed there's a safety bolt on the percussion version. So let me try and get this in the right position. This slides forward into a notch on the back of the cylinder. So I'll try and show you the notches. You might just glimpse them between the these very sort of um, fenced off walls, effectively around the nipple, to, to try and prevent flashover. There is between each of those a little safety notch. Colt did this with a little pin that the, ha the hammer would sit down on, so that you couldn't really rotate the cylinder and it wasn't going to come down on a cap. Well, 
the Adams way of doing it. Uh, and this is um, for, for, for both versions of this, because they did the work to convert them. This was um, John Adams' company, the Adams Patent Firearms Company uh, on the Strand in London. I think I remember to tell you that. So that's it locked in place. Cylinder can't move, can't cock it. Um, so in a way, that ejector rod safety that they designed for the conversion is a direct replacement for something that you could only really do with the percussion cylinder. Well, I guess you could have done a version of it here, um, but it would have been difficult um, geometrically to figure out how to do that. And this is just a better way to block the cylinder. It's more positive. So why am I going on about that? Um, <laughs> well, I think it's interesting in itself, but also put the right way around. No, nope, that was the right way around. Uh, so that sliding bolt moves in a cut in the frame. And here's where it's, it gets really very impressive in terms of craftsmanship here. You can just see it. And I don't think, frustratingly, you'll be able to see it on camera. But there is. They have filled that little groove that the bolt sliding safety bolt runs in and dressed it off flush and refinished the whole gun. The, all these pistols were completely um, polished uh, flat and smooth on all angles. That's why they no longer have um, all their markings from the percussion era. Um, notably on the side here, some I've seen still have them, but a lot of them they've been obliter obliterated. It probably depended what condition they were in when they were found in stores as to whether they got fully rounded off or not. Some of them you can still see the lines, the um, decorative lines around the frame. Some of them you can still see some and occasionally all of the Adams patent and the, serial, the old serial number because they had to re-serial number all of these as well. And some of them have the faintest hint of this mark here, the broad arrow WD for War Department, the ownership mark of the government. Um, if they don't, if that one isn't visible, they re-stamped it with a, a stamp version. These are engraved on. It's very quaint, but um, <laughs> of course, that's what they were doing at the time. I do need to show you this side of the percussion original. Uh, this is how you do the load. So it's a ramrod, it's a form of uh, lever ramrod that seats the bullet just the right distance into the chamber and then clips alongside the barrel for storage. That gets removed, of course. You don't have any need for that. What you need is a rod to poke the case out or the live round out, so that's removed. And probably again, best to show you uh, this way around. So that, that rod on the side, that gets removed we then machine off, so a large part of this area has to be machined away uh, to create a place to insert a new retaining system for the cylinder. So explain what I mean by that. So the cylinder on the percussion gun is retained by this tiny little turn bu uh, button thing. We rotate that, we pull on this, pulls out the axis pin, and the cylinder drops out. This one, it's not playing ball, so we won't pull that out. We replace that system is removed, so it's it's removed and covered by the housing for the ejector rod. So what do we do? Well, we install a push button here. It's a much better system actually. Press press the button, pull out the axis pin. One further step on a cartridge revolver, usually necessary, is um, undo uh, open the loading gate. And then that should let our cylinder do have to withdraw the hammer as well. Let's our cylinder drop out. So there's our freshly machined precision piece of engineering, uh, complete with stops for the um, neck of the cartridge case. So although the rim stops it from dropping through the cylinder anyway, uh, it's also a, uh, a, it's a precision fit. So the reason I've picked this one to show you, even though it's a little bit um, broken, <laughs> it's in good condition otherwise, but uh, mechanically it's not, not perfect, is because this is number one. This is the first pistol to be sent back to Adams to be converted for cartridge use, uh, which means that instead of just a four or five digit serial number, it has literally number one and then the word converted, which is reflecting the fact that the Mark I Adams, 1872, which is what this is, was a conversion of the old percussion atoms.
So I've mentioned about uh, the Royal Navy being the main sort of user of revolvers uh, and the cavalry uh, sort of picking it up later on. The, the, the Lancers are still using single shot pistols and most of the British cavalry have stopped using pistols of any kind. So they, they go back to using the revolver later on. Uh, but that doesn't happen until 1878. So these are naval revolvers, effectively, alongside a couple of other designs, until 1878 when the army picks them up. Uh, and that's for cavalry, initially. And then eventually, they are, you know, it's a, it's a standardised thing that whoever needs a, a sidearm in the army would be issued, uh, well, an Enfield or later a Webley. Of course, alongside that, we have the officer story. Officers always need a pistol of some sort. Um, go far enough back, they're carrying a sword and a pistol. Later on, just a pistol. And we standardise on a service calibre, 0.45. Long story short, it's the same thing as 476 and 455 in terms of the bullet diameter at least. But the, uh, the details of the ammunition change. So 1878, the year before um, uh, Isandwana and, and, and the movie uh, Zulu, to place this in its proper historic context for those of you who, who are uh, like me, pop culture buffs, movie buffs, is you should have been seeing Mark 1s or Mark 2s of these in Zulu, in Michael Caine's and other people's hands, not what they actually used, which if I remember rightly, were just First World War Mark VI Webleys. You know, squint and they look similar, but they're actually quite distinctively different and really nicely Victorian to look at, I always think. Um, they have that sort of design sensibility to them. Uh, I suppose the Webley sort of does, but it had been, uh, it become very sort of workmanlike, as it were. Um, and sort of war finish as well. These, as you can see, even when they refinished them for cartridge use, they're still beautifully blued with walnut grips. They just couldn't get over the fact of, you know, bright, bright steel hammers and triggers. They had to look nice to do the job. By the First World War, that, you know, so many weapons were needed. You just had to give up on that. Manufacturers like Webley would mark their, and um, uh, Smith & Wesson as well in the States, would actually mark or otherwise represent that their revolvers were war finish. So don't panic, civilians. When you go back to buying these, they will look like they did before. That's the idea. So th these are still beautifully made. Does it matter in the battle scenes in Zulu? Not really, because you can't really tell the difference. A bit like the Lee Enfields. But <laughs> I just thought it was worth mentioning, because it's it, we often talk about these things, uh, sometimes in isolation, and we don't think about where they are actually used. So Royal Navy and then cavalry from 1878. Um, but that's for, that's for um, enlisted ranks and, and NCOs. Officers are able to carry these things um, well, right the way through. So from potentially from 1872, they might have got hold of a commercial version of these. We have commercial versions of these that are identical. So you probably would have equipped yourself with one of those, not from issue stocks. If, you might be, if you're wondering now at me saying that this is the Mark I Adams, well, that's that is what they called it, um, give or take a few words. Um, does that not get confusing with the Adams that was in service before? Well, no, because the pistol that was in service before, its formal name was actually, and I have to read this, <laughs> it was pistol, comma, ML, muzzle loaded, comma, rifled, comma, revolver, Dean, 54 gauge. And yes, we used the word gauge because we hadn't decided to start using the word bore arbitrarily yet. Um, <laughs> that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down. But um, so the this was the Dean revolver, and then when we go to revolver breech loaded Mark One, they use the word Adams to to differentiate. So even though, and this is because of Dean Adams and Dean, which was the incarnation of the Adams Company that created um, the original percussion revolver. So they're all Adams revolvers to us here today, but um, in military service, that's a Dean revolver, and that's the Mark I Adams revolver. Now there is then the, the Mark II and the Mark III. So the Mark II comes in at exactly the same time and is the newly made version of the Adams. And it's very distinctive. Uh, we won't get into it here today. We wanted to focus on just this part of the story, but if you're, if you're wondering about the Mark II and the III, they have a pin here and a two-piece frame. You'll be able to find videos on, on those, especially because of the uh, use by the Mounties uh, in Canada of the Mark III, 
Mark IIs weren't made in too many uh, numbers, so they're not quite that common. Um, this is lesser known, which is why we've brought it uh, to you here today. But yeah, functionally speaking, you could have been issued a Mark I, a Mark II, or a Mark III, and you wouldn't have given a monkeys about all of the nerdy details that we go into here. Uh, it's, it was, it was re-engineered to make it easier to make on slightly more improved modern technology and just easier to assemble as well. So they went for a two-part frame that, that fits together, whereas for conversion, they were stuck with the solid frame of the original um, Dean slash Adams revolver. Hi guys, Jonathan Ferguson, Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum. I have some exciting news for you. In March, we're going to be running an historic firearms event, which is great in itself. You'll be able to show up for free and see some extra exciting things, as well as the displays of firearms that we have in the galleries. But on the 11th of March, um, I'm going to be available for a live episode of What Is This Weapon that you can come and see. Um, and we'll also have a bit of a Q&A option later in the day as well. So both of those are ticketed. They're going to be different sort of tiers of tickets that you can purchase. Um, we have the link down in the description, but you can also check out the website or social media. You shouldn't be able to miss it. Um, so that you can come and see me and watch me do my thing and perhaps even come and say hello and have a bit of a chat as well. So very much looking forward to that event um, and to that day in particular. Hope to see you there.